These are confidential documents from police files. They contain the type of information that's used to plan assassinations. A year ago, steps were taken to stop files like these going missing. But in the last few days, World in Action has discovered that sensitive police documents may still be ending up in the hands of killers. Two thousand people have received government grants to protect themselves and their families from the assassin's bullet. And innocent lives may already have been lost because some police officers have allowed inaccurate and misleading information to be used by gunmen to select their victims. Northern Ireland, where for 20 years the police have been in the firing line in the battle against the terrorists. The war against terrorism has claimed many innocent lives, including nearly 300 Royal Ulster Constabulary officers. But tonight, World in Action investigates claims that some members of the United Kingdom's bravest police force have been pointing out targets for gunmen. Well, you know, in this country where you point a finger today, a gun may be pointed tomorrow. And if a policeman says to a loyalist that a particular person is in fact a member or the, of the IRA or in some way involved with it, uh, that man may go out of there feeling he has another name for his list. 26-year-old Gerard Slane was murdered by the Protestant Ulster Freedom Fighters last week. He was shot on the staircase of his home in front of his wife, Teresa, and nine-year-old son, Sean. Gerard was never, ever involved in any organisation. He lived for me and his kids. He never bothered with anybody. He didn't drink and he didn't smoke. He didn't go out at night to get a couple of videos. And he would sit up the all hours the night watching videotapes and that. He just didn't bother with anybody. Three fellas had sledgehammer their way into the house and ran up the stairs. Jared had heard the glass or something breaking in the hall door. And just as he got to the top of the stairs, he started shooting. The kids were sitting laying over their daddy's body. And obviously they'd seen all this blood, which I didn't want them to see. I don't think he actually knew what happened to him. His family insists Gerard Slane was not a terrorist, but his killers justified his murder by publishing what appears to be a police photograph. Gerard was only ever arrested once. You get your photograph taken and you're issued a boiler suit, and this was a mugshot from Castlereagh, because Gerard was definitely wearing a boiler suit in it. What happened when you asked the RUC if it was a police picture? Well, they just said that they didn't know for certain whether it was, and they didn't know how it got into the hands of the ones that killed him. This loyalist magazine is used by the terrorist Ulster Freedom Fighters to defend their choice of targets. As former editor of that magazine, I was in receipt of certain photographs. They weren't uh, original photographs, photocopied. Uh, photographs, uh, which I published over a long period of time. Where do you think they came from? Well, I mean, no one knows. They've obviously came from a loyalist supporter who didn't agree with the aims of the IRA. It wasn't obvious to me initially that it was an RUC photograph because there was no markings or anything that could attach it. But when I looked at the photograph, I thought it may have been a mugshot from an RUC file. One-time soldier Ken McGuinness had first-hand experience of working with RUC intelligence documents. But despite the huge numbers used by the security forces, he's confident little goes astray. Uh, there was very little confidential or uh, top secret information uh, which made its way into the hands of terrorists. When you're up against an enemy who is killing your friends who, is, wish, who wishes to kill you, you're more concerned with your own safety than with actually thinking about photographs which are, as, as I said, like confetti to a penny. But photographs and other detailed police intelligence are highly valued by loyalist terrorists. In Londonderry, the police recovered a massive haul of their own documents from one group of loyalists. One of those arrested has named three RUC stations as the source of the leak. You simply cannot overlook the fact that well over, possibly in the region of 2,000 of these montages, uh, 
were available within the entire community and available to paramilitary groupings. That is not a minor thing because each of those people then became a potential target for assassination and some were assassinated. World in Action has established that as a direct result of police files ending up in the wrong hands, the government has been forced to pay out social security grants totaling tens of thousands of pounds to protect the homes of the many hundreds of people whose details have been leaked. The RUC insists that any of their files that may have fallen into the hands of loyalist terrorists has the lowest security classification. The fact is that the information appears to have included photographs, names, addresses, registration numbers of vehicles, and in some cases the, the movements of the people concerned. Now whether you regard that as low grade or not, it is evidently more than sufficient for anyone who has an interest in those particular individuals to be able to identify them, to track them down, and if necessary kill them. In the last 20 years, the police in Northern Ireland have suffered appalling casualties. IRA bombs and bullets have claimed nearly 300 IUC lives. Intelligence gathering on a massive scale is a vital part of the fight against terrorism. I certainly remember times when people would have been asked after a terrorist incident, have you ever seen that man? And a photograph would be handed perhaps to a, an ordinary motorist and asked, have you seen that man? We, we know that as the years went by and uh, members of the security services came under threat, there were times when members of that service would have handed the photograph to someone within their family and said, if you ever see that fellow about, let, let me know. But there is evidence to suggest the pressure of fighting a 20-year war with the IRA has led some RUC officers to cross over to the side of the terrorists by pointing out targets for loyalist gunmen. Do you accept that the hundreds of RUC documents that have been found in paramilitary circles means that there is a considerable element of collusion going on there? I'm concerned that so many of these photographs actually are in circulation. That was carelessness. That was something that basically people didn't think about. This carelessness may have put innocent lives at risk. Sean Breen has no convictions for terrorist offences and no connections with the IRA, but he has had trouble with the RUC. If I'm coming back from a dance hall or a border, if I'm out late at night and I'm stopping the RUC, there's usually five or six of me on patrol and they would get around me and start pushing me about. Rather than lie down them, I would tend to fight back like. Sean Breen may be a nuisance for the RUC, but there's no evidence he's a terrorist. But the police have warned him he's listed as a Republican on documents found with loyalist paramilitaries in Derry. I was stopped by the RUC, and uh, a guy asked me, could I step out of the car? He wanted a word with me in private. So I, I done this, and uh, he told me that uh, my name was on a, a paramilitary hit list that I was going to be shot dead. Sean Breen now guards against loyalist attack every day. He's received a government grant to pay for locks for his home and he's sure his life is in danger because the police have labelled him a terrorist. I have no doubt there's certain members of the RUC would pass it on because I'm not a very like person because every day I get stopped day in, day out, maybe sometimes six, eight, time, eight times a day. Sean Breen is right to fear for his life. World in Action has discovered his personal details appeared alongside genuine Republicans like Sinn Féin councillor John Davey in the Hall of Police Files found in Derry. In the latest attack, Sinn Féin councillor John Davey was ambushed driving home from a council meeting. Three gunmen lay in wait near his house before opening fire. John Davey's widow Mary has kept the bullet-riddled car in which her husband died. Damien McBride, a Sinn Féin election worker, was one of the first on the scene of the Davy killing. I think the first shots were through the windscreen and the side driver's window. But then whoever was doing the shooting came down the side of the car and the, the, the rear passenger shot through the rear passenger window. Two or three uh, shots, possibly pistol shots, through the rear passenger window. Mm -hmm. So was he... Uh, wasn't alive now? No, Mary, he was... He was, he was he was killed probably instantly. When the police recovered their files in Derry, they found that the photographs had been updated by loyalists now facing charges for conspiracy to murder. 
Not long after witnessing the murder scene of John Davy, Damien McBride was warned he too was listed as a potential target with details of his home and family. Surely as an active Republican, you can't complain that your name is on police files. Um, I'm aware that it's on police files. I'm not surprised that it's on police files, but what I do strongly object to is the fact that it's in the hands of loyalist paramilitaries uh, who have no right to access to it. Sinn Féin councillor Hugh Brady was also warned by the police. An RUC officer showed him his photograph after it had been recovered from loyalist paramilitaries. The photograph was dated uh, and it, it actually said on the photograph DOA and I asked the RUC detective, uh, can you explain those initials? And he said date of arrest and it was dated the 24th of August 1982 when I had been arrested. What concerns me most obviously is the fact that uh, a photograph there is clearly uh, identifiable to myself and my legal advisor as one belonging to the RUC. Uh, I believe that this, this photograph had been handed from uh, an RUC person to a loyalist paramount. Brady too now has reason to fear for his life to the spiral of violence here took another twist with loyalist paramilitaries entering the Irish Republic to murder a Sinn Féin councillor. Three weeks ago, another Sinn Féin councillor, Eddie Fullerton, was murdered in his home by a gang of masked assassins. World in Action has learned that Mr Fullerton's details are listed alongside Hugh Brady's, Damien McBride's, John Davies and Sean Breen's. The IUC have admitted that files have gone missing, but point out that to date, no IUC officer has been charged for passing documents to terrorists. The primary source for all uh, security documents and intelligent uh, documents is the, is the police. And uh, I would know from some of them that they came directly from uh, police sources. And I suspect that most of the others were compiled uh, in police stations by the police and made available to the army and the UDR. So I have no doubt that whatsoever that the primary source in intelligence terms was the, was the OUC. The public outcry over the leaks of confidential documents forced the RUC to respond. An outside inquiry made up of English policemen was created to investigate alleged collusion between members of the security forces and loyalist paramilitaries. The English detectives began by taking a fresh look at some old RUC cases. At the beginning of 1989, this man had been arrested by the IUC after his fingerprints were found on police photo montages recovered from a loyalist arms dump. I was questioned for two days about this fine. It's obvious my, my prints were on these because I'd handled these at a party innocently. They seemed happy enough with that and released me after two days of questioning. But there were, all these documents were official documents. They were stamped, police office, um, restricted, classified, and attached to certain RUC stations. What was their attitude? The RUC wanted it housed up, pushed under the carpet. So they were happy enough to get them back and quite time of it. But the English detectives were willing to investigate cases the RUC had chosen to ignore. Led by Deputy Chief Constable John Stevens, they prosecuted large numbers of loyalists caught in possession of security force documents. As a result, this man was given a four-year jail sentence for his crime. Where, where, where's the justice net? Why, why is it a crime for the Stephen Inquiry and not a crime for the RUC? Loyalists say the RUC took a keen interest in the line of questioning by the English detectives. One occasion, an RUC uniform says to me, what are they questioning about? I told him. And he says, for f***'s sake, don't say anything. He says, don't say anything to him. The chief constable of the RUC promised the public that all allegations would be fully investigated by the Stevens inquiry. Can I remind you that I appointed Mr Stevens? He was not forced on a reluctant RUC. Hardly you may feel the action of a force with something to hide. But despite the chief constable's assurances, the public's confidence in the ability of the Stevens inquiry to get at the truth was further shaken by the events of January the 11th last year. The Stevens detectives had been able to seize more than 2,000 security force documents from loyalist terror groups. Thousands more files and notes were kept on computers at a secure office supplied by the RUC. 
At 10 p.m. that night, the Stevens team left their office, locking the door behind them. They held the only keys. When the English detectives returned, just three quarters of an hour later, the room was ablaze. Everything was destroyed. A subsequent IUC investigation into the incident concluded that the fire had been accidental. Mr. Stevens assured an increasingly skeptical public that his investigation was unaffected as everything of value had been duplicated and stored on a computer in England. But it's very difficult if you have a cohesive, disciplined, uh, a pretty intelligent group of men who want to hide something from you. Well, it can be done. John Stevens presented the results of his inquiry to the Chief Constable of the IUC in May last year. I have been able to draw firm conclusions that members of the security forces have passed information to paramilitaries. His team made 94 arrests and secured 59 convictions, but there was one surprise. Not a single IUC officer was charged. Amnesty is not satisfied with the outcome of the Stevens inquiry, principally because it looked at a sliver of the problem. And it did it in an extraordinary way, which has resulted in the charging and prosecuting of people who received information, thereby enabling them, if they chose, to kill citizens of the United Kingdom, but has not resulted in any charge or prosecution against any member of the Royal Ulster Constabulary who presumably provided them with that information. The Stevens team did send evidence on two IUC officers to the Director of Public Prosecutions in Northern Ireland, but he declined to press charges. The inquiry was supposed to ensure that the IUC would no longer lose track of intelligence material that might be of use to terrorists. But tonight, World in Action can reveal that sensitive IUC documents continue to go astray. In the last few days, we've been shown hundreds of police documents dated March this year. They include the names, addresses and car numbers of 20 men named as terrorist suspects. And they also contain detailed travel arrangements for a trip made by a senior Southern Irish politician across the border into Ulster. This is the type of information used in the past to plan assassinations. But police suspects and even politicians are not the only groups at risk of ending up on a terrorist death list. Lawyers who clash with the RUC also feel threatened. Oh, well, by and large, the generality of RUC officers see us as what we are, as professionals doing a professional job, as indeed uh, they see themselves. There is, however, a, a small cadre of people who see themselves really not as policemen in the sense that a Bobby in London is a, is a policeman, but uh, as a soldier in a, in a war against the paramilitaries. He's in danger himself, he carries a gun, he, he sees himself in, as involved in that kind of warlike situation. He sees everybody who's not with him as an enemy. Geraldine Finucane's husband, Pat, was a solicitor who defended many terrorist suspects. Two years ago, he was assassinated by the loyalist terror group, the Ulster Freedom Fighters. This afternoon, lawyers from all over Ulster were among the mourners at the funeral of Patrick Finucane. When Pat started in business, he did all types of work, any sort of work that came along, um, as most young solicitors do. But gradually, as they began to find their feet, they realised that there were very few solicitors who were prepared to and who were capable of representing people who were um, up on terrorist charges. John Stalker, in an earlier investigation of the RUC, was among the first to realise the depth of hostility felt by some RUC officers towards Patrick Finucane. John Stalker came over to speak to Pat um, in the hall up in Crumlin Road Courthouse. And it was a professional conversation about the case. Afterwards, when John Stalker walked away, a police officer came over to him and said, what were you doing talking to him? And John Stalker was quite puzzled and he said, well, he's a solicitor involved in the case. Why shouldn't I be talking to him? And the policeman said, he's nothing but an IRA man. Don't talk to him. Three years later, Amnesty International also became aware that Pat Finucane was not popular with the RUC. 
Patrick Finucane himself told Amnesty International uh, that he understood from uh, people who had been suspects in custody that when they attempted to contact him, he was labeled by the RUC as an IRA lawyer and uh, that detainees were actually dissuaded uh, from, um, from contacting him or that the police attempted uh, to dissuade them from doing that. Uh, another uh, detainee whom we interviewed said that he was told during interrogation uh, by the RUC that Patrick Mnookin would be killed. A client of Pat's was being interrogated and he was told to change his solicitor, otherwise, beca well, because he wasn't going to be around for very much longer. On January the 17th, 1989, Douglas Hogg, then a junior government minister at the Home Office, told the House of Commons, I have to state as a fact that there are in Northern Ireland a number of solicitors who are unduly sympathetic to the cause of the IRA. That was a very alarming statement. It frightened me. It certainly upset Pat. And I think it made us sit back and realise that perhaps these threats that have been going on in Castlereagh were not just interrogation techniques. It seemed to move everything onto a higher level. Well, it was utterly deplorable. It was the kind of thing one might expect from somebody in a bar with a few too many drinks. And coming from a responsible source like that, it was a source of deep worry to lawyers. Both the IUC and Douglas Hogg have declined to be interviewed in this programme. Two men burst into Mr. Finucane's house in a well-to-do area of North Belfast late this evening and sprayed it with bullets. His wife, Geraldine, was also hit. Three weeks after Douglas Hogg's original statement, loyalist gunmen shot Pat Finucane dead in front of his family. After Pat died, it was brought to my attention that solicitors who would represent loyalist uh, suspects, that while they were being interviewed, it was suggested to them that they should do something about Pat because he was too successful and it would be convenient if he wasn't around. And Ulster loyalists have confirmed that some RUC officers expressed strong views about Mr Finucane. Well, prior to Pat Finucane's murder, loyalists who had been hauled into Castlereagh Interrogation Centre had been told by the RUC that Pat Finucane was a well-known IRA member. Why did they think that? Well, it's, it's very hard to work out, but um, when the police told you something like that, people tended to believe it. Do you think that contributed towards his murder? I would say, with all sincerity, that it probably did. But at his inquest, the RUC said there was no evidence that Mr Finucan was an IRA man and they considered him a very professional solicitor. The abnormal becomes a normal very quickly in this country and... Uh, yeah, after Pat Finucane's death, well, one had to have a care for one's own safety. Maybe it's a warning to solicitors not to go too far. Um, you can do your job, but just as far as this line here, don't try and challenge the system too much. Um, one of your members has been killed. Um, and it's always in the back of um, lawyers' minds, it must be, that if they're too challenging, they will bring adverse attention to themselves. No one has been charged with the murder of Pat Finucan. And no police officer is facing charges of giving information to terrorists. But doubts about the impartiality of the IUC persist. Political talks about the future of Northern Ireland began today. A lasting peace will be hard to achieve unless the police are trusted and accepted by both sides of the divided community. But for now, the lives of both the RUC and those they protect will continue to be at risk.